Thank you, and, and welcome all of you friends of Balboa Park who are here today. I don't know who's minding the park this morning because we have everybody here to talk about a, a very interesting subject. And I'm going to make some opening remarks uh, and then turn it over to our speakers and then turn it over to all of you to make comments or ask questions or however you want to express your love for Balboa Park. Uh, we are, Balboa Park is, I'm just going to read my notes to make sure I can get through this faster. Uh, Balboa Park is our crown jewel and is perhaps uh, the most beloved place in the city in the region of San Diego. And we're getting ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the park, of the Panama Pacific Exposition of 1915. And I want to read a quote from uh, the president of the, of the fair, G. Aubrey Davidson, who described the fair saying, these buildings of this exposition have not been thrown up with careless unconcern that characterizes a transient pleasure resort. They are part of the surroundings with the aspect of permanence and far-seeing design. They might endure for a century and still appear the things of beauty which they are. Time will hallow them with his gentle touch. It was, he was absolutely right. The mission for the celebration from the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership Report is to celebrate a year of cre creativity that brings together innovative experiences with art, culture, nature, technology, and science. The partnership's report states that the anniversary is also a significant opportunity to look forward to the next 100 years of the park's evolution. Roger Scholey wrote uh, three years ago in an article, the centennial could be an occasion that would provide the impetus to complete all sorts of projects we have sitting on the shelf. And we in San Diego have big shelves with lots of projects waiting to happen. But you need to start somewhere. And that could be and should be at the heart of the park, returning the Plaza de Panama to the people. A goal that has been proposed, discussed, debated ever since we let our obsession with the car and being able to park wherever we want uh, in front of the store turn large parts of the park into parking lots. In time for the centennial, Dr. Erwin Jacobs has moved the goal forward and proposed a solution for returning the plaza to people and everyone agrees it's time to do this. With this being San Diego, and excuse my cynicism, <laughs> while we all agree on the goal, we do not all agree on the means. And something, sometimes even have problems discussing what the goals are and how to achieve the means. Uh, and what are our approaches? The flyer for this morning's meeting says C3 has long advocated for increased pedestrian use of the central Mesa of Balboa Park with the commandant goal of de-emphasizing de automobile use in the park. Under the sponsorship of Dr. Erwin Jacobs and with the support of Mayor Jerry Sanders, the Balboa Park Plaza de Panama Circulation and Parking Structure Master Plan Amendment has been initiated for the central area of Balboa Park with the National Register Landmark, within the La National Register Landmark. If approved, the project is proposed to be completed by 2015 in time for the centennial anniversary of the park. The proposed bypass bypass bridge off the eastern portion of the Cabrillo Bridge as a solution to eliminating all vehicles from the plaza and adjacent areas has ignited a storm of opposition. A storm of opposition that brings people to have breakfast together, which is good. Uh, it's also good for C3's uh, budget. Um, a storm of opposition from historic preservationists and others. Is the bypass bridge the best alternative to accomplish the end, its end result? Are there alternatives to be considered that could possibly bridge the gap and enable the project to proceed uh, with greater support, which is the reason why you're all here, to find out whether there are alternatives. Let me introduce our, our panelists and give a, a short bio of each one, but I'm going to be very short because I want to save as much time as possible for the speakers. Our first speaker to speak about some of the plans that are being proposed right now is Mark Johnson, F-A-S-L-A, is a founding principal of Civitas, an urban design firm in Denver, Colorado. Mark is a nationally recognized urban designer with over 20 years of experience in design and landscape architecture for public spaces. <clears throat> he has been responsive for the designs of new facilities, streetscapes, college campuses, redevelopment plans, and goes on and on. He's been doing a lot of work here in Balboa Park, on the San Diego River Project, uh, Convention Center, and more importantly, a new school speaker at, uh, to my classes. Um, 
and that's why Vicki Estrada is so important too because she speaks to my classes as well. Vicki Estrada is a landscape architect, an urban designer, and president of Estrada Land Planning. The firm's mission is to design spaces and modify the land in a creative and ecologically sound manner. She believes that landscape architects are uniquely qualified among design professionals to create design solutions that consider sociological, environmental, engineering, art, spatial, and architectural factors. And lastly, we have Dr. Mick Hager, who is going to present the view of, of the institutions in the park about what's being proposed and, and about where we're all going. And let me just read a little bit about him. Dr. Michael W. Hager has been in the museum profession since 1965. He was a professor of geology at Augustana College uh, from 1973 to 78, director of the Museum of the Rockies, director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and has been president and chief executive officer of the San Diego Natural History Museum since 1991. Dr. Hager, Hager is also president of Cinema Corp of California's an educational film production company uh, from 1998 to the present. He sits on the board of the Balboa Park Committee and is president of the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and have him make a few remarks about where he's going. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us here. We really appreciate it. I'm here representing the Plaza de Panama Committee and Dr. Jacobs, as you know. And I have a presentation here which I'll try to keep very brief. Uh, it's simply pr showing you what the proposal is. I'm not uh, showing you all the rationale and analysis and those kinds of things. We have, however, done a lot of analysis, a lot of data collection on how cars and people move and park and drop off and valet, et cetera, within the park. So we think we understand the problem quite well. There are these goals that the committee has established for the project. First, to rehabilitate the plaza. Second, to eliminate vehicle traffic from the plaza. As many of you know, originally this, the uh, plaza and the bridge were not designed for vehicle traffic, but in 1918, the Parks Commission passed by vote to allow cars into the park. There are a few dignitaries that came across the bridge during the exposition, but it was not general traffic. Third goal, to increase parkland. Uh, today, there's a lot of land taken up by cars, as we all know. Uh, limit pedestrian vehicular conflicts. It's very easy to experience those today. Improve transportation systems. We're proposing a tram to connect our underground garage to the plaza. Build on previous planning. Uh, many of the elements that we're proposing are in prior plans that have been approved. And to complete this project by New Year's Eve 2015, which will be exactly 100 years after the original celebration. I'm just going to walk through the elements of the project. The Plaza de California in front of the Museum of Man today has the road through it and the planters. Originally, it was a very simple open space with uh, small trees in boxes placed at the columns. And we intend to do exactly the same thing, to restore that. Uh, El Prado West looks like this today. You can see it's really a roadway, uh, quite wide, and the plantings are generally up against the, the archways. But this is what it looked like. It was actually a much narrower pedestrian way uh, with these trees and lawns that really set off the buildings, created a space for pedestrians and a, an elegant way of seeing the buildings in a formal landscape that was very complementary. Because as you know, the designation of this, this place as a national landmark is based on the total composition of landscape and buildings. It's not one or the other. So we intend to restore that as well, exactly as it was. The esplanade is the space that leads down towards the organ pavilion. And this is what it looked like. It was really very beautiful. It had this gentle slope. There, were no, uh, there was no curbing. There, the, you can see that the seating was actually bleachers and this beautiful uh, decomposed granite or similar kind of pavement. And we will pr uh, propose to restore that also. This is what the park looks like from the air today. You can see this is a 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, so the plaza is not full of cars yet. And what we propose to do, if you look carefully, I'll go back and forth so you can study the comparison. This is the proposal. You'll see in the core of the park, uh, the, the central Plaza de Panama would remain essentially an open space. We're talking about a double row of trees along the side so there are comfortable and shady places to sit, some uh, movable furniture and things like that. El Prado with no cars. And you, if you look very carefully on the right, you can see the bypass bridge, 
which is that arc. And I'll, I'll go backwards. So here you can see that bridge. You'll also notice in the distance, kind of the upper right, the park on top of the parking garage. I'll go back again. There's, you can see the Oregon Pavilion parking lot. And I'll show you another view of this so you get a better uh, look at it. And here you're seeing the extension of the park. The core idea is to put the cars fully underground so that we can connect the park from the Palisades up to the plaza. Here, zooming in a little bit just to give you a better sense of what that might look like. And our intent here is to uh, make a place that really is a living room for the community, programmable but comfortable on an everyday basis, fully pedestrian. We think it's appropriate that there might be vehicles uh, sort of after hours, after events, et cetera, to pick people up, et cetera, within the plaza, but essentially to change the paradigm. Today, it's a, it's a place for cars that people use. We want to change the paradigm to make it a place for people that occasionally cars might use. Here's a, uh, a very early view of what that might look like. This shows the possibility of, of some water that uh, people could play in. Uh, there was water in the plaza in the 1935 exposition. This shows the possibility of moving the north fountain, the fountain that's in the core of the plaza today, perhaps between the House of Charm and House of Hospitality, uh, because we feel it relates well to those buildings. Here's the Oregon Pavilion parking lot. You can see the uh, Museum of Art in the distance and the Esplanade. And here is the proposal to, you can see, if you look very carefully, you can see that one side of the garage is exposed to the air for ventilation. You'll also note, if you look carefully, that the roadway would pass to the right-hand side of the garage, connecting to President's Way in the lower left on the screen. And this, this reconfiguration of the roadway in this location is something from the precise plan from 1992. So I'll go backward again. So you can see it's a much more substantial uh, contiguous and, and uh, conjoined park space. And I'll point out also that the top of the garage, this, this green that you see on top of the garage is the same level as the Oregon Pavilion and is connected directly to the international cottages across Pan American Way. Now, uh, the bridge itself, we're well aware of. I've made many, many presentations and fully aware of the controversy regarding the bridge. And so I, we've done a little work on the design of the bridge, and I wanted to show you our thinking on that. This is Goodhue's original watercolor. And you'll notice it's a very powerful drawing. He renders the Cabrillo Bridge as a very muscular kind of structure with this, <laughs> this pure top and, and what I refer to as descending arches as opposed to ascending, to me they descend the way, from the way that the bridge connects the mesa tops. And he renders here in his own painting the landscape as uh, essentially empty with these Italian cypress composed to show off the view, much the way that any painter would compose a landscape to create a focus. In Goodhue's other work, which we've, we've studied pretty extensively, it's very interesting to see his design principles. You'll see the use of colonnade is very common. On the right, the Los Angeles Cathedral, you'll see the lintel or the cornice line of the building in the foreground with the descending columns. The ascending elements, the gabled element and the shaft, the tower, have ornament. So his, his typical technique, and you'll see it in the, the Havana Cathedral on the lower left and in the, in the private home with the colonnade on the upper left, his typical technique was to draw a datum line using a cornice, to have columns go down and ornament go up so that the ornamental parts like the, the, uh, the tower in Balboa Park, very beautiful, very ornate, they're posed against the sky. So you had a very different attitude about how buildings sat on the ground than how they addressed the sky. And you see those exact same devices in the plaza. So the colonnades create that datum. The buildings are actually fairly simple boxes. If you really look analytically, their cornice lines are very, very level and very much setting up the datum so that the ornamentation is at the window, the door, and the tower. Here's the Museum of Man, uh, shortly, uh, this is probably during the exposition, and you can see the same thing at play. The Museum of Man creates the datum, and the dome and the tower ascend and give you this beautiful skyline effect. And really important point to make here is what's below is all about proportioning. It's actually very simple architecture, but it's about the proportion of the 
windows and those false columns, et cetera. Another thing I would ask you to note here is you see the little white lines below. This was not what was in the painting. What was actually planted by Goodhue during the exposition was a grove of eucalyptus trees, the same eucalyptus trees that are there today. And if you think that isn't the case, here you actually have a view of the initial planting of the eucalyptus, eucalyptus grove. So instead of the idea that this was set against a barren landscape, in fact, it was set in a forest. And this is what that forest looks like today. This is from Nate's point. So these trees are part of the historic composition. They did grow. The bridge would be somewhere in that picture. Very hard to tell where because as the, the trees go all the way down to the 163, so as their canopies layer up, it's very difficult to see through them. This is about the best picture you can get of that corner today from behind the Balboa Park Club. Now here's uh, a view that you've seen many times. Again, this idea of the bridge being a kind of datum with these descending columns describing the landscape. Very beautiful. So we looked at other examples of where bridges do this. When you build a new structure next to an historic structure, an historic district, it's very important that you not try and take the attention away from that. So the new structure needs to be somehow quiet and elegant and simple. And our proposal begins with this, the idea of creating a simple curvilinear bridge. It actually makes a very strong arch for seismic forces if it's poured as a box beam, very slender, four and a half to five feet thick, with very narrow columns. The columns can be as narrow as two feet at the top. Creating this kind of a idea where the bridge, again, a simple bridge with descending columns, which here is what the view looks like today. Uh, as you cross the Cabrillo Bridge, you can see I'm kind of leaning over the railing to get the picture. You can barely make out the corner of the Museum of Man there and the, the original eucalyptus trees. And this is what the bridge looks like if you don't cut the trees down. And we have no reason to cut the trees down. And because uh, others frequently do this to our drawings, this is what it looks like if you do cut all the trees down. Uh, I, I, I find it quite interesting. People are constantly taking our drawings and, and doctoring them up to make them look the way they want them to look. So here you are from an aerial view, focus on the corner, and in that same aerial view you can see the bridge going around the Museum of Man, continuing through the Alcazar lot, and then down to the garage. And I think I'll close it with that. Thank you. We could have got a smaller screen for the uh, presentation. One of the things that, as Mike mentioned, you know, that, that there's been so many different options that from the very beginning, you know, when the, one of the first master plans in 1960 was done, what you'll see here in a minute, is that they've had one common goal, and that is to remove parking from the plaza, but become more urgent. I mean, um, the Bartholomew plan in 1960, uh, some of you have heard of, I'm not sure how many of you have actually seen, but I think it's worth noting what it is that, uh, um, can hardly see that little red line, but the bridge would remain open, and they had actually traffic going down and under, and then up and going to just west of the Oregon Pavilion, and, the, and again, the pedestrian plazas were supposed to happen. Now, I am fairly um, familiar with the master plan. Believe it or not, half of my life now, since 1981, I've been, uh, I started work on the master plan in 1981, and that took nine years uh, to, to get that plan approved, and there was an awful lot of community input, so a lot of the things that you see in the plans were, you know, they were not my ideas, they were a result of a lot of um, community input. But I think it's important in context to kind of see, well, you know, um, if we're going to talk about the plaza of the Panama, we need to look at a little bit bigger picture because you can't really talk about the plaza without looking at the big picture. So uh, one of the things that was interesting in the, the uh, 1989 plan is the plan actually showed, um, you know, that laser just no longer works. There it is. Um, that actually was a one-way in in that master plan, okay? 
and it did show uh, the plaza closed, uh, the, the, the cars going in that southwest corner of the plaza, and pretty much the major elements of the precise plan were there in, in, that, in that plan. You can see that uh, the original version of the master plan, it was a lot more um, vegetated as opposed to being more hardscape, which the precise plans ended up being, but still the notion of a one-way in, going back down this way and going down and around, um, and actually um, the, uh, uh, the plan that was just discussed, Basically, from this point south, it's pretty much the same as the master, uh, the master plan. The precise plan started to work in 89, and that took three years. Now, that's a lot more detail on that plan, and I think it's important to look at some of the elements. And, and again, looking at it in a bigger context, the, um, um, the Palisades, uh, you know, the goal there was to restore that plaza to the grandeur that also it had in 1935. And, uh, and bring back the singing fountain and that sort of thing. Again, getting rid of the parking lot in uh, what was once a plaza and should be uh, again. But just to kind of summarize then uh, what the precise plan shows that it was, it is actually, it got sent back to two ways, okay? A lot of studies were done, I'll talk about in a minute about closing the bridge and, and you know, managing the traffic. But coming through the one corner, having a handicap parking here by the Alcazar, going down and around um, back o over to President's Way. Well, the goal being you can come from the zoo all the way um, to the Aerospace Museum without actually um, crossing a street because there would be one new undercrossing um, in that location. And the blue stars then indicate where the major parking areas would be and there was gonna be a parking structure. Interesting to note though that if you know why, you know, Vicki in the precise plan is the parking structure white because actually it was designed at one time, but um, the uh, city staff at the time decided, you know what, we need to have a national design competition. And the posters were done to actually design that parking structure with a green roof on it. And, you know, that what the precise plan says is the top of that parking structure um, could not be taller than the finished floor or the Orkham Pavilion, and it had to have a green roof. Um, so, uh, and again, pretty much, Mark's plan is pretty much is, is keeping, um, keeping with that. And again, just kind of a blow up of, of that lower left-hand corner. A lot of detail was done. And there's, I know there's some controversy about the fountain, and I'll explain, you know, why I, we, we put the fountain in here in a bit, and that's the same slide that Mark started with. Again, it was um, earlier a, a largely open, open plaza, and over the years, you know, Earth Day, you know, this is what happens in Earth Day, so there are times when the bridge is close to traffic, um, and, you know, it, you know, they have buses and shuttles because nobody would, in their right mind, try to drive to Balboa Park on, on, uh, on Earth Day. Here's what it looks like, and here's what the plaza would look like, so basically circulation-wise, we actually would come in this way, go into the handicap parking, and go back down and around. Um, now, is that common? Because that's one of the questions, you know, well, the conflict between cars and people. This is a, uh, a plaza in Europe where um, you actually do see the cars um, hitting the corner of that plaza, and it feels like the cars are intruding into the plaza as opposed to pedestrians being in an in in automobile space the way it feels today. So there are places where that happens. And I'll explain why I think that that may have some, some, some merit. In Mexico, the same sort of thing. Big, large plaza and bollards really separate where the automobiles go from the plaza space itself. Now, in 35, there was uh, an arch there, a little bit different focal point. So when we started, I had to put a picture of my son and my grandson in here. Um, <laughs> This is a fountain in New York. Pe you know, the, the, the goal for that fountain was to have a place where people could come and touch. It was not supposed to be a fountain in the middle of a parking lot that you can't even touch. And when the, um, uh, Mary Elizabeth North uh, uh, donated the money to build the, the fountain, um, we thought that it would be important, and there's the fountain there. All the tiles, by the way, they, everything was handmade. And, uh, and, and Mark, I can see the, somewhat your logic in moving it, but I, I need to say that the, it's not gonna be cheap to do that if you really wanna move that fountain. And here's our quick simulation of what it um, looks like now and what it might look like you know, very quickly in, in the middle where, again, the flexibility, if we, we do have an outdoor living room, this would be it. We have nothing else that comes close to being our major outdoor living room. So along with, uh, you see a graphic here to remind you of the Balboa Park Promenade Project, there was a series of nodes and links, and that's why you know, really the hinge point of, this, of the whole park is the Plaza of the Panama, so it's quite an important spot. 
the Park Boulevard Promenade, very briefly, just kind of uh, creates some, really a, another Prado that goes north-south, where they have the zoo entrance and exit over here. So um, from the B. Evanson Fountain, you can look northward, and here's what it looks like now, and here's what it might look like when it's done, so that the rest of the park is then connected to, to, the, to the zoo. Now, there have been 50 years' worth of alternatives, and I'm going to actually focus on, on alternatives here, all the way from no cars at all on the court to shuttles only, cars in a perimeter, you know, this is a, a, a pedestrian-only place. Uh, let's put parking underneath the plaza, like in Golden Gate Park. Um, actually, there have been ideas to do robotic parking underground. Uh, when we were working on the master plan, we got all sorts of uh, mails and brochures from people trying to convince us that robotic parking was, uh, was the answer. Oops. Um, also, the managed parking, you know, rather than doing anything <laughs> physical, can we close it during certain times? Maybe make it one way in, one way out after the plays are, are done. So there's a lot of possibilities from that area as well. And Quinn Street was talked about, actually, you'll see here in a minute, an alternative that actually I came up with many, many years ago. In 1987, what basically became the price, precise plan was to keep the bridge open, cut the corner. These were done, actually, as part of the EIR for the master plan. So um, I actually went through three different firms working on this, on the, on this project. Um, they were not related because I worked on the, on the, on the project. <laughs> um, the handicap parking here, and then, of course, the parking structure over here in this area. Now, some of the options were discussed. Well, do we need a parking structure at all? Let's put the parking over an inspiration point and make where the parking structure is totally open space. Or, you know, as we said, you know, that from a cost standpoint, uh, it is more expensive to do a parking structure with green space on top, but it certainly would be cheaper just to do a, uh, um, a, a green area. But, um, well, well, I'm sure we'll get some comments on that. Um, the notion that we need to want to park, want to park closer to where we're going, and even though it's not that much farther from Inspiration Point, there's almost always parking in Inspiration Point, and people will go round and round and round for half an hour when they could have parked over here and been there, you know, twice as twice as fast. Another notion is to, well, maybe we just do handicap parking here, another handicap parking and make it open space. Other alternatives were, um, and this was, Mark, Beck's basically a variation of yours when I first did this, rather than go straight across, let's cut the corner, much like what you did and come back around. This is not really that different than, than your plan. The only difference is yours is a little bit more, more right angled. Um, the, it's good to keep nodding yes, because if you start <laughs> saying no, if you start going no, that was, that would, I want you right here. Um, another notion, and again, I want to talk about this, because this something has been brought up, because originally, i got to be honest, my first idea was to close the bridge. And, and, and that is something that was very controversial. The art museums, particularly the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the art museum there, said that if you do that, we're going to go out of business. But, you know, I've always contended people aren't driving around going, oh, look, honey, there's an art museum. Let's go. You know, you know that you're going to Balboa Park. So it's a different kind of a, of a situation. It's not a typical storefront. Um, but, and actually, you know, Mike Stepner have talked about this. And how many of you, when you have guests in town, actually, you know, who've never been to San Diego, one of the things you do is... You know, you drive them across the bridge. There's a, a certain charm associated with that. You know, of course, we could walk across if there was no other option, because, but because driving is there, you drive across the bridge. Now, uh, this is uh, five, four years ago, there were some traffic studies done, and you can see that, not traffic, uh, uh, user surveys, that twice as many people for this survey actually came in from 6th Avenue versus Park Boulevard. Now, what this survey didn't tell you and that those numbers is how many of those were actually using it as a shortcut versus actually using it as a destined, you know, going to the park itself. But the notion is it's not, gonna, it's not as simple as it sounds. Just close the bridge and everything will be fine, okay? There are, and there have been a number of different, I just got this from, uh, from um, Google Earth, the, the traffic counts, and it's been, been somewhere around 7,000 or so um, that uh, the, the counts across Lower Street Bridge. Now, other alternatives were um, that we came up with years ago was, you know, the Quint Street Bridge, which is now really just an off-ramp, because um, remember, used to, years ago, you used to be able to use Quint Street as an on-ramp as well to go southbound on 163 or 395, as it was called in those days. And uh, um, what this does is actually... Um, return it back to two-way and allow you to do the east-west connection, and the bridge is closed, you go Quinn Street, you come back up around this way. Now, interestingly enough, this idea has resurfaced again, and uh, um, 
there have been alternatives looked at, but you know, here's what it might look like, come back down and around, and that becomes pedestrian, and this becomes uh, the traffic. And then actually embedded in that, there's an intra-park shuttle, you know, that might be used to, to actually make it. And there's been some renderings um, that have been actually prepared uh, to, you know, to show what this might look like. So clearly there's a lot of passion on this issue. Um, another option would be to, to close the bridge totally, not have any kind of, of a crossing, but this is a little bit different here. Um, that 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 then what happens? You kind of basically have 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 a dead end. Other options were, as I mentioned, one way manage in and out, uh, a larger parking structure. Um, the um, idea then of making that one way years ago um, in '89, the city actually did do a study, uh, a one day test to see what it was like as as one way. And here's an article from that day that closing the span of the traffic one way, that, that test was considered a, a, a success. Remember years ago, we also had the Frank Wright, Lloyd Wright House there. And it was, the bridge was, I mean, the, the um, parking was not allowed in the plaza for a, a long time. And you know what, the, the park didn't, didn't fall apart. There have been other alternatives as well. Um, I believe you've got some of these on your table, actually. I think Jay passed some of these around. So there's been a lot of passion. Jay's notion is that, you know, the plaza's pretty big, um, and maybe uh, the activity area is in the north half, and we can basically extend the promenade that Mark showed a little bit further, fur further north. So there's a lot of options variations. So if you were to ask me, Vicki, what are your recommendations, what it is that I would do? What do you think, Vicki? What do you think? <laughs> I would make two projects, and actually our design council actually, uh, uh, design professionals talked about this, and because it is fairly inexpensive, you know, let's close the, let's get rid of the parking in the plaza, um, leave it two ways from now, cut that corner, you know, doing bollards and so forth is fairly cheap, um, there's no bypass bridge yet, M make that a separate project. Um, there's no parking structure as part of project one. You manage the traffic, you can close it, you can make it one way, do a lot of experience. It's low cost. You can do it now. Clearly, you know, 2012 is within reach to do this. You don't have to do a whole lot. And then begin to, rather than try to, to spend all that money to do a bridge, it may be possible then to break it up into two phases. Now, phase two would have several different options. One might be to close the bridge, except for traffic shuttles, um, build the parking structure, Here's an issue we need to talk about, and that is uh, the pay parking. Um, because when we were working on the master plan, I thought I was going to get my head cut off one day, one day when I mentioned pay parking. Now, some of you may remember this. Roger Hedgecock had a huge rally at the War Memorial Center on the pay parking issue. And it was uh, you know, several hundred people in a room, and, and it was all this controversy. There's no way you can do parking because if you pay for parking, uh, a lot of the people who don't want to pay, they're going to mess up the surrounding neighborhoods. Now, I can tell you, if, the, if we charge for parking in the new parking structure, where do you stop? You know, because the zoo probably is going to want to charge for parking, and then it's going to keep going. So it's not a simple thing just to say, well, it'll have to pay for itself to charge for parking. I think there's some issues with that. Um, option B would build the bridge as Mark shown, build the parking structure. It's pretty much uh, the plan that Mark had shown. But you know what? That doesn't have to happen necessarily be th before 2014. We can still close the plaza, get what we want for the most part without doing that. Option C is to construct it as per the precise plan that we did, um, build the parking structure and, and, and not pay. And option D would be constructed as a precise plan, um, except don't build the parking structure there do the parking structure an inspiration point across the way and actually turn the uh, Oregon Pavilion parking lot into uh, open space without making it a, a green roof as such. So that is a fairly brief, for me, presentation <laughs> of what's going on. Good morning. Well, as mentioned, I'm uh, uh, here as president of the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership, and I represent the 26 cultural organizations in the park, uh, and we have uh, come out in support of the current Jacobs Plaza de Panama project plan as proposed. That plan returns 6.3 acres of parkland to the, returns it to the cultural core of Balboa Park for pedestrian use. It also creates two acres of new parkland on the roof of the underground garage, especially useful as a gathering and event space for the 2015 celebration. 
It adds 270 new parking spaces near the cultural core. A landscape Plaza de Panama without cars is an important addition to the cultural core, creating a gathering and event space, especially important for the 2015 uh, celebration. The plan will decrease congestion and pedestrian car conflicts, thereby enhancing the visitor experience. It will improve automobile circulation, handicapped accessible parking, and valet service. And the new tram will pro be provided between the parking structure and the Plaza de Panama. We believe that this plan and project can be completed in time for the 2015 centennial celebration and will add, add significantly to the creation of a world-class event. One of the major objections to this plan is that the bypass, bypass bridge just west and south of the Museum of Man would obscure the view created by architect Bertram Goodhue. In fact, that view has been obscured by eucalyptus trees planted by Goodhue for more than 50 years. The bypass bridge would affect very few trees and would be obscured from, from view by them just as the building is today. Some favor the closing of the bridge to automobile traffic. This is strongly opposed by the cultural organizations because 40% of the traffic entering the park comes from the west. This is strongly opposed by the residents and businesses west of the park out of concern for uh, parking pressure in the neighborhoods, increased traffic, and loss of business. Some favor a smaller Plaza de Panama with cars traversing the edge of that space. We have been shown similar plazas in Europe uh, for comparison, but many of those that have been shown uh, in the past, at least, uh, are paved spaces with little landscaping uh, and historic but fairly plain buildings. When completed, the Plaza de Panama will be landscaped and surrounded by beautiful buildings in people-friendly spaces. I can't imagine cars on the Prado between the Natural History Museum and the Art Museum, but they were there until 1973. I just went out yesterday and walked the proposed project and as I came down the Prado, I saw people strolling casually, uh, photographing buildings and uh, street performers uh, and so on, and really enjoying that space. And then you come to the end of it. You get to the Plaza de Panama, and there's cars everywhere, and, you, and the pedestrians get shuttled off to the side. Imagine what it will be like when that can happen, when people can stroll down the Prado all the way from the Museum of Man to the Natural History Museum and from the Art Museum to the Oregon Pavilion without encountering cars or parking lots when the full beauty of the buildings and the landscaping can be enjoyed. Currently, 7,000 cars a day use the plaza and roadways and on weekends and 5,000 cars a day use them on weekdays. That is clearly not conducive to pet pedestrian use or a positive visitor experience. Every plan for the park over the past 60 years has proposed removing cars from the cultural core and returning it to pedestrian use. We have a great opportunity to make a huge improvement in Balboa Park in time for the 2015 celebration. And I hope that we can all work together for the greater good of Balboa Park and complete this project. Now, we saw a lot of alternatives today, and, uh, and we've seen a lot of alternatives that people have proposed. <clears throat> and my response to that, th this is one that can get done. This is one that uh, we don't have to talk about or postpone. This is one that will be funded, uh, and we can get it done in time for 2015, and it's been a long time since we've made any major improvements in Balboa Park, and I hope that you'll get behind this project and help to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the speakers, and I want to now throw it open to the audience, because I know everybody here wants to say something. Uh, but I want questions or brief comments only. You know, if you feel you have to make, no long speeches, if you feel you have to make a comment, pretend you're on Jeopardy and phrase it in the form of a question to one of the panelists. Uh, but I think it's important that we do have this dialogue, because this is part of what is necessary for us to resolve whatever conflicts we have with the park and the proposals to reach a common goal, which is to remove the cars from the park. 
And this is the kind of, I, I believe, the kind of place to do it. A public hearing is neither public nor a hearing, and is an inappropriate place to have this kind of discussion. So you are starting this because we have not had meetings like this too, uh, in the past uh, on this project. So I will throw it open to the audience and see who's raising their hand. And uh, I'll start over here, and I'll just work my way around. Mike. Stand up, Mike. I'd be interested in hearing the opinions of the panel of uh, converting the Palisades parking into public plaza as part of this project. It seems that the expense of the bypass <coughs> would yield a lot more public space if it was spent on the Palisades itself. And the location of the parking structure as proposed is right next to the Palisades and would be very convenient to convert it all over at one time. I'm afraid that. If you don't take this opportunity now to do that, that you're going to lose that leverage in the future to be able to make it work. So I'd just be curious to what you think about the Palisades. Uh, and I don't know if everybody heard the question. I won't go through the long description Mike gave, but what about the Palisades and converting that to? You're looking at me? I'm looking at <laughs> <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> I, I, the, the original parking structure for the master plan actually was intended to replace the parking that was lost in the Palisades and the Plaza of the Panama. So that's how those numbers were, 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 were generated. Now, I'm not going to get up here and say don't, don't build the bridge, but actually would the numbers probably, uh, could you build a, a decent plaza uh, instead of that? Probably. Uh, but then, you know, it's going to take time to build that parking structure. And one of the things you have to look at, and one of the, the dilemmas we had with the parking structure is from President's Way then, you know, during peak times, what happens when everybody tries to get out of, out of, out of, out of a, you know, two-lane road? And are there other, rather than putting all your eggs in one basket, is it better to put smaller structures, you know, throughout? But briefly, um, yes was my answer. I do think that's something that I, I am concerned that if this happens now, people say, oh, Bell Park, Park, Bell Park Park's fine. Nothing has to happen for another 30 years, you know, which appears to be the pace that sometimes things happen. I think it's a great idea to get the cars out of the Palisades. I just don't think it's, I don't think that we should combine the two right now because there's a, there's a, a timeline that we need to get finished by 2015 and trying to do it all at the same time, um, I think would impede that. However, as you know, there's a, uh, a move to uh, uh, and, and a process in which we're forming a, a conservancy to, uh, to um, manage Balboa Park in the future. Uh, and that would be a great project for the conservancy to raise the funds for that and to uh, convert the Palisades um, into pedestrian use and then put an another parking structure maybe at Inspiration Point or, or in, that, in the existing lot behind the Hall of Champions. I, th I think that'd be a great conservancy project for the future, and and I think with the conservancy comes the hope that we don't have to wait 30 to 50 years every time we want something in Balboa Park. That those are projects that the conservancy can take on and, and get accomplished. Ditto. Oh, good. Uh, this one is from Mark. Uh, yes, please. Uh, this one is from Mark as far as the. Bypass road that starts in front of the Museum of Man. You know, my imagination is that have you studied the traffic? Maybe instead of the medallion over the arch, I going to see a traffic light over there. So, you know, how are you handling left turn, right turn, pedestrian uh, signaling? You want to repeat the question too? Sure. Uh, the question is how are we handling the turning movements and, and traffic at the intersection of the new bridge with the existing bridge? Um, we've done quite a bit of work on that. We have, uh, as I said earlier, many counts. The, the proposed bridge would be two-way in and out, so you'd have right turns into the park and left turns out of the park. Uh, in terms of the amount of traffic we have and the simulations that we've done, it functions very well with the stop sign, and uh, not a, there would be no reason to have a light there. Um, we have one of the things, I won't, I won't try to over-answer the question, but I think, Vicki, by the way, your presentation was really great. I appreciate seeing all those alternatives and help, helping all of us understand this is a very complicated problem. It's not just, it's not just about a bridge or a left turn or something like that. Um, the traffic is up a lot. In the, the Google that you showed, there's been a dramatic spike in the last 
10 or 15 years in traffic, and that's, that's really a big part of the problem because we don't know how to deter that traffic from crossing the bridge. The basic problem with this is, is that that bypass bridge does not conform to federal guidelines for historical preservation. It also, it creates another thing that has to be maintained. And by this, looking at the structure, and as one recalls some of the earthquakes that we've had in California, <coughs> this type of structures don't stand up very long. Basically, a lot of them are poorly designed to begin with. The other thing is the parking garage there. It's like left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. We're trying to deter traffic on one hand and then create a place for it on the other hand. I just uh, feel very strongly that that bypass bridge is ill-conceived. It does not fit in to the historical preservation. As many may be aware that the bridge was built in 1914. It was designed for automobiles. The first person to go across it in an automobile was the future president of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And that, I think if you look at Soho's plan, that's the one that makes the most sense. Only costs about $10,000. This one costs multi-million dollars, and then you've got the maintenance. Now, just one more comment, if I may. I'm opposed to the parking garage also, because if anybody's been up in that area in the late afternoon and evening, that's when the transients move into the park area, and that would be a threat to women and children that might be down in that garage getting on an elevator <coughs> and also being accosted on that elevator. Thank you. Howard? Picky, okay. is the existing size plan still relevant today? And it, does it have uh, authority? Should it be funded? The, well, you, that's two different questions. <laughs> <laughs> the precise plan that I showed is, in fact, the current governing precise plan for the Central Mesa of Balboa Park. Um, you know, years ago, the Museum of Man actually wanted to expand southward, you know, where their chapel is, or five feet to the south, and um, they had to go through precise plan amendment process, and, you know, they, they backed off from that. So there have only been a handful of amendments since it was approved in 92. Um, as I said in my last slide there, that I, I do think that the current plan is relevant and you could return the plans of the Panama. If we're talking about that, you know, focusing on that, not the entire precise plan, because you're right, I mean, to do the whole thing before 2015, I don't see how that could be possible. However, is it clearly possible to do a plaza in the plaza of the Panama for people? Yes, you know, I do think you can do that. So the answer, is it relevant? Is in and uh, you know the same source of funds that's going to fund the bridge maybe could go fund some of, you know some of that as well so uh, I don't know you know so there's some uh, um, um, I, I do think it's relevant I saw somebody shaking their head no in the audience but. <laughs> yeah I, before before I call on Chuck I I, I do want to make a comment Vicky mentioned the, the funds and what the source of funds and it, she also showed on on the on her slides the uh, proposed competition that was held or supposedly held for the Spreckles Organ Pavilion and talked about pay parking. As we get into debates in this city, that's a relevant case to look at. We, I managed the design competition for the Spreckles Organ Pavilion parking garage many years ago. <clears throat> and as we got into the debate about pay, pay parking, all the money we had set aside to build the Spreckles Organ Pavilion is now paying for the parking garage at the police station on Broadway. The city has a tendency to move funds around from good things to other things, so we have to be very judicious about making decisions and moving forward in this community, which is a very hard thing for us to do. Chuck? Uh, yes, I have a comment and then a question. Um, it looks like we're, we're uh, attempting to improve and clean up two of our major assets in the city, the, <coughs> the living room in Balboa Park and the front porch on the waterfront. Uh, the great thing about those two spaces is the diversity of the people and the cultures that we see. It's free, and you see families from all across our, our county and South Bay and across the border come in and enjoy the free pleasures there. So I hope that whatever occurs here, we don't deter that from continuing to occur, whether it's in our living room in Balboa Park or the waterfront. And this is a question. I've been asking this whenever I've been able to attend a Balboa Park committee meeting. 
is why aren't we trying this on a weekend every month or every weekend now through the end of the year? Let's see what it does if you close the bridge, but you also need a tram, and let's do it. Let's try it out. They did it in Central Park when they took the cars out on the weekend. It seems to be wanting to do everything at once. Why can't we start trying it? It's been done at Earth Day, Frank Lloyd Wright House. Sure, there's inconvenience, but let's get used to it. Let's try it out and sample it. Pick one day a month if you don't want to do every weekend. So that's a question. Why can't we do that? <laughs> There's absolutely no reason why we can't do that. <laughs> Next question. There are 21 handicap spaces in the Plaza de Panama today and six in the Alcazar lot, making a total of 27. Uh, our proposal has 31 handicapped spaces in the Alcazar lot with a new ADA walkway back to the plaza. And that's what the precise plan has to do. Okay. <laughs> you were waving the most. <laughs> Good morning, Mike. My name is Kevin Swanson. I own San Diego2015.com. Uh, in a couple, couple things. One is, in the Old West, there was a gunslinger that came from the outside, took care of the boss's business, and then left. In some ways, I think of Mark kind of being that way. No. <laughs> I guess. You're from Denver. <laughs> <laughs> However, we keep referring to the Earth Fair and the number of people that come to Balboa Park for the Earth Fair and the number of people that come to Balboa Park for the Earth Fair don't support, on an economic basis, the cultural institutions in Balboa Park. Also, all the other free things that take place in Balboa Park don't support the cultural institutions in Balboa Park. So on an economic basis, what are the number of people, first of all, that are ideal paying coming in from those cars that are supporting the economic institutions in Balboa Park? And number two, for the 2015 centennial celebration of 52 weeks, What's the optimum number of people who would be enjoying Balboa Park and what would the economic benefits be of those proposed economic benefits to Balboa Park? We're here to support the park. Is that a question or is that a comment? There's a question. There were certainly a question. Yes. Yeah. The cultural institutions, what is the number of people that they see at Balboa Park posting? As many as possible, uh, fr fr from the economic point of view, uh, I think 2015. It, it, there's a lot to be decided about 2015, and there are several committees working on that. So, um, and I, um, so I think that is to be determined what how that's going to work, and whether there's going to be one admission for the whole park or or uh, or an admission at all. So I, I don't know the answer for 2015. Um, I think we're looking at, uh, I've seen numbers of an additional 500,000 to a million people in Balboa Park during the 2015 celebration. Um, and I didn't understand your first question. Uh, the uh, Earth Fair is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, has outgrown Balboa Park and kind of, and really basically shuts it down for the day. Um, and uh, while I'm a, represent a natural history museum and we're certainly interested in Earth Day. I just don't think it's a good fit for Balboa Park at this point. Um, I got one thing for you, Kevin. Draw. Many of you know that I worked on the land use circulation and parking plan for Balboa Park from two, roughly 2002 to 2005. And it's, it's commonly called the Jones and Jones plan, but I actually ended up leading that plan. And so we studied, you know, we, we learned a lot and studied a lot at that time. One of the things that I advocated at that time pretty forcefully, and I, and I didn't get a lot of traction, was that there ought to be a, a way to achieve a consensus on sort of when is enough enough for cars in the park. At what point do you reach the capacity 
of, of the park for cars. And uh, I believe that's something around 8,000 total cars on the Central Mesa. There's about 74, 7,500 today. And, and yet I pushed it and pushed it and pushed it, but quite honestly, I didn't get that much traction with that issue. Tom and then Jay in the back. I have a question for Mark and then a question for Vicki. Uh, Mark, uh, where's the funding for the plan coming from and is it contingent upon specifically that plan being implemented? And then <coughs> Vicki, uh, I didn't really hear you describe the problems with the, the bridge as being proposed by, by Mark's plan. So uh, maybe that's implicit, <laughs> but I would have like a little more discussion about why that bridge in that location is such a problem. Yeah, quick as possible answer. The funding is two sources for the garage itself, a revenue bond pledged not against general revenue of the city, but against park, paid parking charges within the garage. And there has been a study done on that. And it, the, the charges for the garage are fairly modest and can support the, oper the, the capital operations maintenance of the garage and the tram. All other components of the project are private donation. The um, contingent, whether the, whether the funding is contingent on this, uh, the committee is raising money actively and believes that they're doing the right thing with this project, but is very interested in listening and learning and refining this proposal as much as they can. Is there a point at which they'll say, no, we won't fund that? I presume there is, but I don't know where that is. Easy question. Thank you, Tom. Um, I don't know if, if you know, I'm not going to say there's something wrong with, with, with the bridge. You know, the second alternative that I showed had a very similar option, and I can tell you why we threw it out. Uh, we threw out that option because of, of, the, of the costs, uh, because of the impacts it would have architecturally and visually on, on uh, much as, you know, some, you know, some people have been saying. And in the end, um, the notion of completely removing cars from the plaza, cars, parking, there was no problem with that. Although back then, actually, some people actually did object to that. But the, uh, um, that, that the notion that there's one little corner they can coexist to uh, that car can just kind of tuck that corner. Be, when you look at the cost benefit ratio in terms of what it costs to do that bridge, and, and, and those impacts, the, uh, the decision was made, not just by me, but through you know, city staff and also the community, that that was a more viable option without going through the expense of building you know, the bridge. So that's why. Jay Turner back there, then Nick Morenovich. Yes. question about whether or not or other large events our benefits to the museum. My background is economic development and historic business district. And the question that we are often asked is why are you shutting down a street or a street fair when in fact you're trying to recruit business? Well, the point is you're bringing people who probably never have come to that for that purpose. You're, you're bringing them in and they get to see, oh gosh, I didn't know this was here, or this was here, or the relationship between, ah, this is the museum of man, ah, this is a significant gallery. I guess my question then is, does the same logic accrue to that the that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that business districts, does that accrue to having a living room where people can gather for events and thus see all the museums that are surrounding. Isn't it sort of the same thing? Well, they told me to answer. Yes, it is the same thing. <laughs> and and as, as a former member of the Balboa Park Committee, I would probably disagree with Mick about whether Earth Fair has outgrown the park. But that's another issue for another day. Oh, uh, Nick Arnovich, my question, my question is, I think the gentleman who mentioned he was representing the nonprofits who were in support of the general plan and the bypass bridge and so on. I think that's what I heard. What was the process that should nonprofits went through to reach that decision? Were you presented with your group or against who presented alternatives? And if so, who presented those alternatives? I'm looking at what was 
say I supported this plan and who presented it? Were there any alternative to what was being proposed presented to the nonprofit? <coughs> Yes, uh, the, uh, most of the hearings, and we heard from uh, SOHO, and we heard from um, uh, the alternatives to the design groups that had proposed a smaller Plaza de Panama with, a, uh, with cars around the edge. So we did look at the alternatives, and, and we thought that this, the plan as presented actually uh, was the best in terms of solving the problems of traffic circulation parking um, and providing open space in the park. So we did look at the alternatives and uh, um, and uh, believe that the current plan, the plan as presented is the best plan that's been presented. And, and I'd like to add to that that we are studying in technical detail the alternative, the precise plan alternative of having the cars through the plaza the alternative of closing the Cabrillo Bridge altogether, and the alternative, which is I'll call the Quint Street alternative, connecting the Quint Street Bridge up Palm Canyon. And we're looking at each of those from a traffic perspective, from a topographic sort of grading and impact perspective. And uh, uh, I'm not prepared to give you technical answers on that yet, but we are taking a very hard look at each of those. I want to take one more question, and then I'm going to take over. Diane. <laughs> Uh, I would like to propose and, and get some responses uh, from the panelists that Vicki's Alternative D, which uh, in, involves incorporating what is now Inspiration Point into the park and, and addressing both additional park space as well as, as very conveniently located parking that uh, uh, would, uh, I, I would hope, would be included in the environmental impact report and dealt with at the same level uh, as, as all of the other alternatives and, and the, the bridge alternative. Uh, many of you may recall that when the Navy took Florida Canyon to build their hospital, uh, the inspiration point was turned over and in the agreement with the city, and I would hope that, that uh, some of the people who are working on this get it out and blow the dust off, uh, it says that Inspiration Point will be used to mitigate the uh, Navy hospital. And there was an agreement with the Navy that they would participate with the city in constructing a park and, and parking on that side. What, what Diane pointed out is that these things just in San Diego, we go on and on and on <laughs> with discussions, and it takes, you know, we, we don't quite get there. And I think it's important that, that we, I'm, I'm going to summarize, that we have this dialogue, that we start talking about it and everybody be involved. I don't know that there's a solution here or a solution there that is the best one. But I do know that the public process will not get us there in the way we're going right now. So there has to be more dialogue of this nature, and I'm going to give you a chance to do that. But I want to make sure that, that we all think about what, what the long-term goal we're trying to achieve. And that's really to start to return the park to people and not to the cars. We, we've got this obsession in California that, God, we have to park everywhere and park in front of the store. and, and one of the battles that, that Mark went through with the, with the parking and land use and circulation study was how can we get increase the amount of parking in the, in the park and um, turn it into more of a parking lot. So we really got to, to come to grips with this issue. I just want one more quote and then I'm going to ask a question. Um, George Marston said in 1927 at the dedication of the Presidio Museum in, in, Pioneer, uh, in Presidio Park, in building a city, let us remember that the material things which will endure longest are those that, are, that express the spirit in art, in the art of landscape and architecture. The spirit of a city can be preserved for the ages. The dialogue needs to continue. I'm going to ask, and C3 didn't say I could do this, but I'm going to put two proposals on the, on, on, out in front of you just to see where we are. One is, is to look at <coughs> Vicki's proposal, which was to have a phased program. First is to 
remove the cars, let the roads so go through, and, and maybe it's sort of a, a quasi-temporary solution that could be done in, in time for 2015. The other, and, and I think you guys have, have already applied for your permits. Things have been submitted to the city? For the EIR, yeah, to start the EIR. To start the EIR. So we start with, with the Vicky proposal or the, I want to say the Mark Johnson proposal. I just, that's what friends are for. Draw. We can do that again. <laughs> I'm calling you, Mike. So I'm just going to ask, just for a show of hands, I, you know, this is, Roger, are you taking notes? Uh, <laughs> All those in favor of, of Take a picture. Vicky's proposal. Okay. Thank you. And all those in favor of the Johnson proposal. <laughs> well, it, it's obviously it's, it's a loaded audience, so that's fine. Uh, but we need to continue this, and I, I'm going to stop it because it's getting time to to wrap up and turn this over to the next event, uh, the room to the next event. But I want to thank you all for coming. I want to especially give another round of applause to, to our speakers. <laughs> and, and most importantly, I think we all have to stay involved in this issue because the park is too important to just sort of let things happen one way or the other. So keep involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.